Hi guys, I'm really happy to be here today and talk to you about the many benefits of a plant-based diet. So exactly what we're going to talk about. Uh, first, I'll talk to you about exactly what is a plant-based diet and kind of distinguish it between or distinguish it from a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet. I'll also go into who's on a plant-based diet now. I thought it would be fun to highlight some very high profile athletes who are adopting a plant-based diet right now and obviously athletes they have to perform at their best so what they take in is really important to them so I thought that'd be interesting to show you. And the most important thing I'll talk about is exactly why a plant-based diet may be healthy for you. There's several different reasons and to finish off I'll talk about how to start a plant-based diet if that's something you're interested in. So I guess people in the nutrition world, they like to show pyramids about <laughs> what, what type of diet they're talking about. Like the traditional American diet or American food pyramid had all the grains at the bottom and then the fruits and veggies, meat, dairy, all that stuff. Um, but this is very different than that in that the vegetables, mainly non-starchy vegetables, make up most of your diet. So about 30 to 60 percent of your calories would come from non-starchy vegetables like your greens, peppers, um, kale, eggplant, carrots, cabbage, things like that. And then on top of that you have fruits. So fruits can make up to 10 to 40 percent of your calories and also beans and legumes which are a great source of protein. And then on top of that we have healthy sources of fat such as meat, seeds, nuts, and avocados. And also the, that's where you get the starchy vegetables in that category there as well. And also grains. And then on top of that, as opposed to the regular food pyramid, um, only 10% of your calories should come from poultry, lean sources of animal protein, dairy, and fish. And then the very sparingly at the very top should be red meat and sweets and junk food, things like that. <laughs> Why is that reversed for some people? <laughs> the junk food on the bottom? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so who are the athletes right now that are adopting or have adopted a plant-based diet? So probably one of the most well-known and probably one of the strongest and fastest people in the world, Carl Lewis. He is, well, I guess you could call him a vegetarian, but he adopted a plant-based diet when he was about 30 years old because he's like, I'm getting older, but I still want to recover as fast as I can. I want to still perform at my best. And so he met up with some doctors that um, specialize in plant-based diets, so he got some information from them. And he cut out meat, cut out dairy, adopted a, a vegan diet actually for some while, and he encouraged his other teammates who are all younger than him to adopt at least a vegetarian diet. So his best years and his pe best performances were after he was on this plant-based diet. And also Tony Gonzalez, He's a 13-time Pro Bowl athlete. Same thing for him. After 10 seasons in the NFL, he's like, I'm getting older, I keep getting banged up, and I really need to find a way to recover faster so that I can keep playing as long as I can. So he, it happened, the plant-based diet for him happened randomly. He was on a plane, I don't know to where, but his, uh, the person that was sitting next to him, he noticed that person just only ordered fruits and veggies whenever the the food cart came by and he asked the gentleman, he's like, whoa, why do you eat like that? Like, why don't you any, eat any meat? And the man said, well, I don't, I don't eat meat. Um, and he told Tony about a book called The China Study. Has anyone heard of The China Study or, or read it? A couple people? Okay. So in The China Study, it basically just shows all these studies that show that eating less animal protein in your diet can be healthier for you. So after reading this book, Tony just cold turkey started on a vegan diet. But as a professional athlete and as a football player, he's like, I need so many calories. It's hard for me to only eat plants. So right now he says about 20% of his calories come from animal protein, but all the rest, fruits and veggies. And he actually has a book out about it now. 
Um, also, Dave Scott, I'm, a lot of people might not know who that is, but he's won more Ironman championships than anyone else in the world. And also, Billie Jean King, six-time Wimbledon champion. She's probably one of the best female tennis players in the world, uh, that the world has seen. And she's also a vegetarian, so she promotes a plant-based diet. And then the coolest athlete who's on a plant-based diet is me. <laughs> um, so this picture is actually of me. Um, I think I was 21 in this picture 10 years ago. I'm 31 now. Um, and I still play field hockey. And same reasons as the other athletes. I'm like getting older, but I still want to be very competitive. And I do play extremely competitive. And actually next month I'm playing in an international field hockey tournament. So my team will be playing against Mexico, Argentina, other country, or excuse me, other teams around the country. And so being healthy and being able to recover in between my workouts and in between games is really important for me. And not to mention, just turning 30 is kind of like, oh my god, I'm 30, like, do I need wrinkle cream or something? But, <laughs> you know, I just found that the healthier I ate, the better my skin is, the better my hair is, you know, and also the better I can perform when I play hockey. Okay, so why would you even consider adopting a plant-based diet? Well, first of all, pretty obviously, is that fruits and vegetables and all different types of plants, they're packed with nutrients. And these nutrients have been linked to reducing your risk of many different diseases, such as heart disease, uh, cholesterol, osteoporosis. Second of all, plants are the most nutrient-dense foods that you can have. So nutrient-dense basically means that per calorie, you're looking at how many nutrients you have per calorie. So you want to try to get foods that are really low in calories, but really high in nutrients. And so you can get that with plant foods. The third thing that I'll talk about is how having a plant-based diet can promote an optimal pH in your body. So the same way that your body has to be at a very specific temperature, your body should be at a very specific pH in order to maintain health. And then the last thing I'll talk about is uh, if, people, if more people adopted a plant-based diet, then there could be a huge reduction in the many negative consequences associated with factory farming, which is where most of animals are raised in our country. So there's Popeye, he's spinach. <laughs> he knows about the plant-based diet. Um, so first of all, Fruits and vegetables are packed with nutrients. So some of these things include vitamins, so like vitamin A, C, and E. And those three vitamins are antioxidants. And antioxidants can help with reducing damage to your cells from free radicals. So free radicals, they can attack your cells and perhaps cause cancer. So the more fruits and veggies you eat, the more nutrients you're getting, the more antioxidants you'll get. And you may be able to reduce your risk of cancer through that. Also, you're getting tons of minerals. For instance, you get calcium. And everyone knows that calcium, getting in enough calcium, can help reduce your risk of osteoporosis. Uh, also, fiber. A lot of times I have, I'll have clients that come to me and they complain of stomach pains. And so usually, especially when I used to work in the hospital, you always have to ask about how are your bowel movements today? <laughs> and so eating tons of plants, fruits and veggies, that will help with digestion. Um, and also another a specific type of fiber, soluble fiber, is great for reducing your risk of cholesterol in your diet. And soluble fiber is found um, a lot in oatmeal. It's found in oranges, apples, kidney beans. So does anybody here have or knows anyone that has high cholesterol in their family, friends? Most of us do. Yeah, so just changing your diet can reduce cholesterol very easily. And then lastly, plants, they're full of omega-3s. A lot of people have the perception that fish is the best source of omega-3 fatty acids. 
but that's not necessarily true. And I'll show you um, toward the end of our presentation which types of foods are full of omega-3 fatty acids, which have been shown to reduce your risk of heart disease. Okay, and next I'll specifically talk about heart disease because one third of Americans each year die from cardiovascular disease. So that could be a stroke, a heart attack, um, they might have high blood pressure, they might have high cholesterol, they might have angina, which is just chest pains. So that's one third. So one out of every three people in this audience may die of a heart attack or have a stroke or you know certain things. And the thing about this disease is that it's completely preventable, which is a shame that so many people are sick from it and so many people die from it. I think about half a million people each year undergo open heart surgery because of heart disease, but it's preventable. And I, I read a statistic that the CDC says that 25% of people over the age of 45 are on some sort of statin or cholesterol lowering drug. That's like 25% of people are on a drug. And that's probably not the only drug they're on. They're probably on like high blood pressure medication or some of them may be on something for diabetes. But sometimes if I tell people to cut back on meat, not eliminate it, but just cut back on it and eat more fruits and vegetables, they're like, oh, I can't, I can't leave my meat. <laughs> but they'll take all these pills that will probably cause some sort of negative side effects to them anyway. So it's, it's kind of funny. But the thing is, there have been so many studies that show that a plant-based diet will help reduce your risk of heart disease. The nurse's health study is probably one of the biggest and longest running studies there have been. It started in 1976 and it used uh, nurses graduating from nurse school and they followed them throughout their lives to find out which types of behaviors, including eating behaviors, were associated with certain types of diseases. And they found that the women in the study who had the highest intake of fruits and vegetables also had the lowest rates of heart disease. And for those of you who have read the China study will know what I'm talking about next, or has anyone seen or heard of the movie Forks Over Knives? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you guys will know what I'm talking about here too. So there's a doctor, his name is Dr. Esselstyn, and he decided to do a study to directly see the effect of a plant-based diet on cardiovascular disease. So what he did was he took 18 patients who were really, really sick. They probably had, at the time of the study, if they had continued on their current path of eating, they probably would have died within like two to five years. And in the previous eight years before this study, total among them, they had 49 coronary events. So that could have been they had a heart attack, they had a stroke, they had chest pains, um, they had bypass surgery. So that's 49 events within 18 people. So that, I mean, that averages more than two events per person. And so what he did was he put all these people on a plant-based diet. He didn't give them any medication at all. And let me re remind you, these people are like about to die very soon. And so 12 years passed after he put everyone on a plant-based diet. And after that, there was only one incidence of coronary event. And that was directly related to the plant-based diet. And the one person who had the coronary event, he actually left the study for two years and came back to it. So maybe that's why. So he basically eliminated the heart disease in these people who were extremely sick before. So that shows you right there the benefit, the health benefit of a plant-based diet. The second reason why a plant-based diet is so important and could be helpful to you is if you're trying to manage your weight. Has anyone here ever tried to count calories before? <laughs> yeah, I have. It's so not fun. Um, but it, it can be a little bit more helpful if you're on a plant-based diet because if you look at the, the different pictures of the stomachs, if you fill your stomach with 400 calories of fat, which could be like french fries, or maybe pizza, 
you know, if you have one slice of pizza, depends on when you get it from, that could be 400 calories easily right there. And just like a medium fries from McDonald's is probably 400 calories. So that's not going to physically fill up your stomach. So let's just say you're trying to be on a 1500 calorie diet and for lunch you're giving yourself 400 calories. But if you give yourself 400 calories of like crap, of fat, then you're still going to be hungry after that and you're probably going to end up binging later on and then you're like, I messed up my whole diet. I'll start on Monday. <laughs> Um, so maybe you're going to be on the Atkins diet or something. You're like, well, I'm going to eat all this chicken because protein's good for you. So you have maybe 400 calories worth of chicken, which could be about like two servings of chicken. So maybe like eight ounces of chicken, which is not common for people to eat that. That's 400 calories. Still doesn't really do the trick of filling up your stomach and getting you that full feeling where you feel like you need to stop. However, on the other hand, if you have 400 calories worth of plants, fruits, and veggies, then your stomach is going to be really full. First of all, it'll be physically full, so hopefully when people are physically full, they stop eating. That doesn't always happen. <laughs> um, but also, you're getting tons of nutrients, and that's the most important thing. So if you look at this chart over here, we have calories, and on this uh, axis here, it should just say nutrients, not nutrient density, but at the very top where you have the least amount of calories but the highest amount of nutrients, you have your green leafy vegetables and also colorful vegetables like red bell peppers, onions, uh, carrots, things like that. So if you're trying to get filled up on that and watch your calories, you're going to be so full of nutrients and as you go down the scale, you'll see that fresh fruit is a little bit lower on the nutrient density scale, but that's because it has sugars, but those sugars are natural and they're healthy, they're not bad for you. And then as you come down, you'll get your starchy, starchy vegetables. So sweet potatoes, potatoes, winter squash. And then below that, that's where you'll find the animal products. So animal protein, it's probably about medium on the range of calories and medium on the nutrient density. But as you get lower, you see red meat and junk food and cheese and potato chips and all that stuff that's fun. <laughs> um, it's usually really high in calories and low in nutrients. So how many times have you eaten a meal? Maybe you had um, a burrito and it had chicken and it had cheese and it probably had some rice and the tortilla and, and maybe you had Diet Coke or something too. <laughs> balance it out, balance diet. Um, <laughs> and maybe it was a burrito, like a huge one from Chipotle, but you're like, yeah, I love that chicken. And so what happens is after that, a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm craving something sweet. And you just ate all that food and you're still craving something, like there's a reason for that. It's because you just fed yourself, but you didn't nourish yourself, you know. And that's the, that's like, I think the biggest problem with uh, diet in our country is that people eat a lot. They feed themselves, but they don't nourish themselves. And so I think that if you nourish yourself with lots of plant products, fruits and vegetables, then you'll end up not having those cravings as much. When you have the cravings, your body's telling you something. It's telling you, I need something else. Like I just ate, but I didn't get what I needed. So if you give your body what it needs, your cravings will actually get lower. All right, the third reason why a plant-based diet is so important is that plants are alkaline forming. So the best way to describe this, like I said before, is that uh, t if you think of temperature, your body temperature has to be very much on point. It's very specific. Does anybody know what your temperature should be? Yeah, 98.6, like 0.6. <laughs> it's very specific. So I mean, think about what happens if, you, if your temperature is 96 degrees. You know, it's only a couple degrees off, 
but you'll probably be shivering if your body temperature gets down to that. Or what if your temperature gets up to 100? You know, it's only a couple degrees away from that, but you'll obviously, you're probably sick if your temperature is at 100 degrees. So the same thing applies for pH. Like your body likes to be at a very specific pH for you to feel good and for you to be healthy. Does anybody know what uh, the optimal pH is for? It's a little bit higher than seven. So it's about 7.35, like between 7.3 and 7.4. So if you look on the, seven is neutral. And so alkaline, which our bodies like to be just a little bit alkaline, 7.34. And the food you eat directly affects the pH in your body. So certain foods are acid forming and certain foods are alkaline forming. And it's pretty much just chemistry. So if you eat certain foods, like if you look at the acid forming foods, so you have mostly animal protein, dairy, processed food, bread, all of those foods will create acid in your body when it's broken down. So what happens? Your, your body gets into this acidic pH and that acidic pH puts you at risk for many different diseases. However, if you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and you see on the other side, you have avocados, your greens, mangoes, papayas, and even things that are acidic, like when they're on your plate, for instance, lemons, they're acidic, but when you eat them and they get broken down, they're alkaline forming, so it's, so it's good for you. Um, so, and that's the case for almost all fruits and veggies, they're alkaline forming, so that will promote health in your body. Um, and I want to talk about osteoporosis and, and calcium a little bit because there's a huge misconception that you need dairy to prevent osteopor osteoporosis and to get your calcium, but the countries that have the most amount of dairy intake, they actually have the highest rates of osteoporosis. And that's because the, specifically the protein that's in dairy plus the protein that's in animals, it creates this acidic environment in your body, which what your body does, your body always wants to stay in a balanced state. So let's just say you're eating all this food that's creating acid in your body. So calcium is, can be a buffer. So a buffer basically means something that's gonna help put your body back into, ba into balance. So if your body's in an acidic state, it will say, I need some calcium to put into the blood to bring me back to balance. So where does it get the calcium from? It'll take it from your bones. No matter what you do, if you're eating all this dairy, it'll always take the calcium from your bones if you're eating mostly these foods over here on the left-hand side. So the true cause of osteoporosis is that people are eating foods that are creating an acidic environment in their body. It's not the fact that they need, they're not getting enough dairy. Okay, and then the fourth reason why, and uh, kind of a, a huge, huge problem that I think a lot of people don't know about is um, that when you adopt a plant-based diet, and when most people do, you reduce the impact of factory farming. And there are several different ways I'll talk about how factory farming affects the environment, how it affects public health, and how it affects our, our resources, and obviously, of course, animal welfare. So because our country is so obsessed with meat and having chicken always and cheese and all these animal products, there's a very high demand for animals. And so over 10 billion, uh, land animals are killed every year to feed our country. And this high demand also means that the farmers, they want to produce as many animals as they can, as fast as they can. And they're basically gonna do whatever it takes to get that because they, I mean, they're in a business. They just think of it as a business. They don't think I'm raising animals or anything like that, you know. Um, factory farms, their technical term is actually called a concentrated animal 
feeding operation. So it's not even called a farm, it's an animal feeding operation, basically. And so, and some of these, they're called CAFOs for short. So, and some of the CAFOs, the bigger ones, they'll have at least a thousand cattle at one. They'll have at least 2,500 pigs, up to 10,000 pigs in one place. Uh, and also at least 125,000 chickens like in one area, and sometimes they may have more than 200,000 chickens in one area. And actually, 90% uh, of chicken that's used for meat are raised in factory farms, and 60% of pigs are raised in factory farms, and 35% of cattle that's eaten in the United States today is, are raised in factory. Thank 
day. One hog produces three times as much waste as a human, and that waste has to go somewhere. Outside of the cramped warehouses are huge open air waste lagoons that are as big as several football fields and prone to leaks and spills. Over a four year period, Smithfield's lagoon spilled 1.5 million gallons of waste into the Cape Fear and Trent rivers. 200,000 gallons of waste was dumped into Turkey Creek. During Hurricane Floyd, the news blown up in the Cape Fear rivers were poisoned with 120 million gallons of hog waste, killing almost all of the aquatic life. Let's look at the impact these okay. have on the surrounding community. That's it. Thanks for bearing with the microphone. Uh oh. That's okay. There we go. Okay, so the second way that uh, the factory farms are harming our environment is through the the overuse of many different resources. Uh, one of those resources being water. In order to feed all of these animals, in order to clean all of the waste off of them, in order to clean the facility, they have to use fresh spring water. And the animal farms, factory farms, use more than half of all of the water that's consumed in the United States. So most of the water in our country isn't even consumed by people, it's consumed by these animals and used to clean their facilities. So the fresh water reservoirs are being depleted, like at a rate that there's no way that it can be replenished anytime soon. Uh, also soil, over half of the cause of soil erosion in our country is due to the animal farming because of the waste that's thrown on the soil. And also, deforestation is a huge, huge, huge problem. In order to feed all of these animals, they usually give them either grass or corn or soy. So where, where are these fields that grow this material for them? They're usually in South America. And our cattle farming is the number one reason for deforestation in South America. And so what they'll do is, like, you, you can see in this picture here, on the top left, you'll see the forest where it was. And then they just mow it down and grow grass. <laughs> and they'll grow corn and soy. And that leads to another problem. So let's just say this crop here that's used to feed our animals in our country it, how is it getting here? It has to be transported like on a regular basis. So that's tons of fuel that is being used to transport the feed and also fuel is used to transport animals. So transport the animals from the farms to the slaughterhouses and then transport that animal product into the stores. Another problem with uh, factory farming is that it can potentially harm our public health. So with all of the animals in the factory farm, so let's just say there's um, a pig house that's the size of this room, and they might have, I don't know, a thousand pigs in here. There's no walking room whatsoever. All the pigs are cramped, and so that can breed certain types of infections. And what happens is they will give the animals antibiotics always, from the time they're born to the time they get shipped off. They're given a low dose of antibiotics in order to reduce the spread of infection. Well, what happens when you constantly give this animal antibiotics? The, the bacteria that you're trying to kill, it will mutate and it'll become a strain of bacteria that cannot be treated by antibiotics. And so what happens if you eat a piece of meat that has this bacteria and it wasn't cooked all the way? Or maybe you handled some meat and it's on your hands and you didn't wash your hands properly and you get this bacteria. So maybe you get an infection, you go to your doctor and they do a little swab, send it to the lab and they say, well, we don't have antibiotics to treat that. And that is a real problem. That's, I mean, that's no joke. And that's really scary if 
some sort of bacteria becomes widespread and it can't be treated. The other thing is that two-thirds of all of our cattle is given hormones to make it grow faster. And uh, in the 1980s, the European Union, they did studies to see if there were any effects, human effects, when the animals they were eating were treated with hormones. And they found that people who ate animal products treated with hormones, they had hormonal imbalances, and these hormonal imbalances could increase your risk of getting certain diseases like cancer. So the European Commission said that we will not accept any beef from the United States for that reason. So other countries won't even eat the meat that we're producing in our country right now because of the way that we treat our animals. Um, and the really scary thing is that for mad cow's disease, only 1% of cattle in our country is tested for mad cow's disease. And what I said before, I, don't, I think it's, um, actually I can't remember, the exact amount of cattle that's killed every year in our country. But whatever the number is, millions of it, only 1% of that actually gets tested. So all this cattle could be going around, it could have mad cow's disease and no one would know. Whereas in, in Europe and in Japan, they test every single cow for mad cow's disease. But I mean, obviously there's smaller countries, but if we had you know, people eating less meat, then there could be a way to check every single cow, if there were less cows that were uh, in circulation. And then the fourth consequence is just animal welfare. So like I said before, if you imagine this is a pig house and we've got tons of pigs running around and they're in these cramped spaces, what do they do? The pigs will actually start to bite each other and they might bite at each other's tails. So the farmers will grind down the teeth of the pigs and they'll also cut off their tails. Usually they cut the tails off when they're babies and no anesthesia, just bring them down the line, cut off the tail keep going. Um, for chickens, their beaks get cut off because when they're in close quarters, they tend to peck at each other. So their beaks get, the en ends of their beaks get cut off. And then also, here's a picture. This is from the movie Food Inc., if any of you have seen that. This is a chicken on the left-hand side from, from 1950s, what it used to look like and what it looks, what a chicken looks like now. <laughs> So it's grown three times as big in less amount of time. So the problem with this, this is, is that the chickens can't support their own body weight. Their skeletons can't hold them up. So a lot of chickens can't even walk because they're just too fat to walk, which is pretty sad. And then with cattle, um, the, the baby cows, they're taken away from their mothers sooner than they should be, what's natural when they're nursing. So they create a a baby cow formula basically and cow's blood and other like maybe chicken waste is allowed to be in that formula so that's and their baby and that's what they're growing up with okay so how do you get started <laughs> on a plant-based diet um, there's many different things you can do and I'd say for most people the easiest thing you can do is just because sometimes I don't like to say okay, take away certain things, but whatever you're eating now, just add an extra fruit or veggie to it. You know, if you usually bring a turkey sandwich um, and your drink and I don't know what else you would eat, um, maybe you have potato with that or something, just bring an apple with you to work. Just add a piece of fruit or bring some carrot sticks, add some veggies, just really simple. Another thing is, if you want to cut back on dairy, try substituting almond milk or coconut milk for that. I find most people are okay with it. Almond milk has more of a bland flavor if you get the, the plain or unsweetened version. Um, coconut milk, it, it's really pretty coconutty, so you kind of have to like that. But just try it out. They usually come in small containers, so if you don't like it, it's okay if you waste it. Um, smoothies are my favoritest way to get in fruits and veggies. And does anyone here have a Vitamix or know anyone that has, yay, Vitamix family? <laughs> um, so any, any blender can work. It depends on the fruits and veggies. But Vitamix is like an awesome blender. You just throw everything in there, blend it up, and it's like you got your day's servings of fruits and veggies. So that's a really easy way. 
And I feel like I should be a salesperson for Vitamix because I'm always trying to sell it to people, but you can get one at Costco for like $375, you know, if your birthday's coming up or if you, you know, have some extra money. <laughs> I would highly recommend getting a Vitamix. You can make soups, sauces, all kinds of stuff, but easiest way to get in fruits and veggies. Um, if you like burgers, maybe try to ask for a veggie burger next time you go out. In some restaurants now, they're making like their own like homemade patties. I just went out to eat last week at Tommy Bahamas down in Laguna and I got a veggie burger and it was like they made it in their kitchen. It wasn't some like frozen soy burger they just threw in the toaster oven. It was actually really tasty. Uh, another thing, a lot of ethnic restaurants like Mexican food or Indian food, they have a lot of plant-based meal diets. Like you can get full, they have lentils, they have beans, things like that. You don't have to order meat. And another cool thing, maybe, if depends on how proactive you want to be, but Meatless Mondays are kind of becoming popular. LA Unified School District implemented Meatless Mondays in all of their schools, and we have it here, says <laughs> Diane. <laughs> Oh, good to know, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, it's already happening here. And also at, just cool information, at Oprah Winfrey's studios, she always has Meatless Mondays at the cafes there. And what else? Oh, okay. And so one thing that's really important, if you're gonna start eating more fruits and veggies, there are certain fruits and veggies that you really, really, really should buy organic. The USDA did a study. They took, um, I guess, maybe about 30 different fruits and vegetables, and they washed them off first. They actually washed them with a high power pressure system, like blasted them with water. And then after that, they tested to see if there were still pesticides or chemicals on them. And the, it's called the Dirty Dozen, these 12 fruits and vegetables, even after they were power blasted, they still were found to have 47 different chemicals on them, which is huge. So if you think like, oh, I'm rinsing it off in my sink and it's clean, it's like, no, it's not clean. You're better off trying to purchase organic uh, fruits and veggies, these specifically. And you can Google that. You can just Google Dirty Dozen organic produce. You'll find it really easily. So if you are going to buy meat, I would recommend that you buy organic meat because you'll know that it doesn't contain any antibiotics or hor hormones. And uh, for chicken, free range is recommended. Pasture raised, I've noticed pasture raised eggs in the store lately. Has anybody else seen pasture raised? Yeah, they're really expensive, but those are happy chickens. Like, they are just having a good time hanging out on the grass. So I'd rather, if, if you're going to eat a chicken, eat a happy chicken, you know. Um, but it's, you'll pay the price. It's a lot more expensive. For a dozen of pasture-raised eggs at Mother's, it's $7 a dozen. It's expensive. But the thing is, if you really want to go toward this plant-based diet, you know, and on the weekends, you're usually making your omelet and maybe you'll have like three or four eggs. It's like, well, maybe just have one or two and then you won't have to buy as much. So it, the, cost, the cost will even out. And then also there's, I just noticed there's a new certification on certain meat products that says humanely raised or certified humane. So if you see that on meat, try to look out for that and get that. You know that those animals were treated the way they should be treated. And then the last thing I really have is a lot of times when people ask about plant-based diets, they'll say, well, how do you get protein? How do you get your protein? <laughs> or how do you get calcium? Or how do you get iron? Or how do you get omega-3s? So I thought I would just say, this is how you get them. And plant products, they have tons of protein. There's beans, legumes, nuts, seeds, grains, um, even certain foods like dark green, leafy veg vegetables, yams, they're full of protein. So if you eat a little bit of those things all throughout the day, you don't have to eat them all at once, but if you eat a little bit throughout the day, then you'll be getting plenty of protein. You'll get all the amino acids that you'll need, the same amount that you get from 
eating animal protein. Also calcium, people say, well, if I'm not eating dairy, how do I get my calcium? But there's tons of calcium in food. Almonds have it, dark greens have it, uh, kale, Brazil nuts. The next thing is iron. Uh, here's a list of great sources of iron. But the thing about iron is that in order to absorb the most amount in your body, you have to have a source of vitamin C with it. So, for instance, let's just say you're having lentil soup or something. Just get some lime or lemon and squeeze it on there and get the vitamin C. Or certain foods like strawberries, melons, um, tomatoes. There's all great sources of vitamin C, so just add those in when you have these great sources of iron, and then you'll get enough iron. And then the last thing are omega-3s, uh, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, they're all great sources of omega-3 fatty acids. And I don't know if people know this, but fish actually get their omega-3s from algae. So instead of eating the fish, you can cut out the middleman, you can get <laughs> <laughs> omega-3 uh, supplements that are directly made from algae. So pretty simple. You can find that at Mother's or uh, Whole Foods easily. And last week, Jessica talked about like more food ideas and meal ideas, how to make veggies the main part of your meal. So I, I'm not really going to talk about that. But here's just an example of a day that is plant-based. It's not vegan or vegetarian. It's just plant-based. So in the morning, you could have oatmeal with almond milk add some nuts and fruit to it. For lunch, maybe you could have a salad with avocado, black beans, kind of like you guys had today. Just think of your lunch today. For dinner, if you wanted to have some animal protein, maybe make a stir fry, but just, you know, if you're cooking for two people, for instance, maybe just use one chicken breast and use that for two people. Stir up, stir fry a bunch of veggies with it. And then for snacks, if you want to make a smoothie, that's great. Or have some veggie sticks with hummus. Like, it's pretty easy. And I think it looks really good, too. It's very colorful. So that is it. That's all I have. <laughs>